Hello, hello everyone. Welcome to the webinar, uh, Revolutionizing Wheat Spraying in Pasture, Unleashing the Power of High Resolution Imagery and T40. Uh, my name is Wayne, I'm from DJI Agricultural. Um, in today's webinar, we are discussing how the cutting edge mapping and spraying drone technology is transforming precision wheat spraying on sloped pasture. I have the great honor to invite James Lyon, uh, who is the director and chef remote pilot from Lyon Egg, to as a speaker to this webinar. Lyon, could you give could you do a bit uh, self introduction to let everyone get to know you? Sure. Thanks very much, Wing, and thanks for attending, everyone. Uh, so James Lyon from Lyon Ag Drone Solutions. I've been flying agricultural drones for two and a half years. Uh, predominantly what we do is a lot of this uh, spot spraying and weed control in New South Wales, Australia. So hopefully you can get a little bit out of today's uh, webinar and uh, yeah, let's go from there. Thanks, Wing. Okay, thank you, James. Now let's get started. Um, just to confirm, are you looking at the catalog page? Yes, we've got that. Okay, thank you, James. So here's the catalog of the webinar today. Uh, I will start by introducing pasture in Australia as general, and then I will pass it over to James to share his views and experience about pasture management challenges, especially in Australia, and how the drone solution will help to tackle those issues, especially weed control. And in addition to that, he will share more on other applications such as fertilizer and seeding using drones in Australia pasture. So um, pasture, what is pasture? First of all, pasture are usually grazing environments dominated by annual species, mainly native grasses, herbs, and also shrubs. And if you look at the picture on the right side, um, pasture lands are a very important portion of land use of the globe. Um, it's, it, we could consider it as the dominant land use, actually. Um, first of all, agricultural lands itself occupies 46% of the world's habitat for land. Um, and within those agricultural lands, 40, 77 is actually used for livestock grazing and food production, which is considered as the pasture. And in the next map, it shows the percentage of land use as pasture. As you can see, pasture is very commonly seen nearly everywhere of the world and countries like um, Brazil, uh, United States, China, and Australia, those are countries owns quite a lot of pasture lands. And Australia specifically, it ranks as number two in countries owning the most pasture lands. So from here, I'd like to pass over to James to share about pasture management practices in Australia and also the current challenges. James, please go ahead. Thanks very much, Wing. So uh, as most of you may know, uh, Australia is very diverse in its landscape. So we range from uh, temperate pastures all the way through to subtropical pastures. So uh, depending on your region, there's obviously uh, different challenges. Uh, managing your soil fertility is obviously uh, a pretty common uh, or universal uh, challenge as far as pasture management goes. Uh, pasture improvement, so seed placement and establishment of pastures. Uh, Fertiliser applications obviously um, vary as well depending on soil types as well. But today we're mainly going to be talking about weed control uh, and obviously pest and disease management, which are obviously integral parts to maintaining a, uh, a profitable uh, grazing enterprise. Uh, so let's uh, go to the next slide there, Wing. So in Australia, uh, there's obviously lots of uh, noxious and exotic uh, plant species or weed species that uh, are invasive into pasture land. So today we're going to be uh, looking at three of the key ones uh, being blackberries, lantana and also St John's wort. So um, obviously uh, there's multiple ways of doing weed control. So if you've got a small infestation of weeds, uh, physical removal of those weeds is obviously an option. You get into more broad scale uh, operations and uh, where the weeds have been uh, invasive for a longer period of time, obviously that's not going to be a possibility due to 
uh, obviously the labour requirements, uh, people being on the ground to, to do that. Uh, you've obviously also got uh, biological uh, control, so you can use biological insects in some cases, uh, as well as grazing management can be used as a useful tool in as far as biological control with grazing and grazing pressure from uh, certain animals such as goats and um, stuff like that. It can be used for um, biological control of things like blackberries. But today we're going to be talking about chemical control options and particularly uh, with the use of drones for controlling um, these weed species um, with chemical control options. Go to the next slide there. So um, a lot of these uh, things such as blackberries and lantana, um, they inhabit land area which is typically hard to hard to negotiate via land. So typically uh, a lot of the control methods is either uh, been by helicopter. Uh, helicopters are good for fast application in large areas. One of the limitations is that it's not very targeted in that it's not necessarily a spot spraying option. It's more of a uh, blanket application. Uh, the other option in a lot of these areas is for um, spot spraying, such as the guy in that picture there. So using a quick spray reel. Um, some of the difficulties here is uh, challenging terrain. Um, you know, you've got the risk of tipping over. You've got people, um, you know, in the field getting close contact with chemicals. Uh, and it's also very labour intensive. So an alternative to both of these options is to uh, the use of drones and with the precision spot spraying with drones in particular. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, with the, the drones, so we can obviously build um, precision uh, spot spraying maps such as the picture on your screen there now. So to do this, um, we can build a 3D flight path using uh, a mapping drone to start with. So we can um, follow any sort of steep terrain. We can mark out obstacles uh, such as trees and power lines. Uh, so the drone uh, can fly safely in those sort of areas. We can mark exclusion zones, so waterways or areas that we're not wanting to be spraying. And we can also mark the patches of weeds and only apply chemical to the weed areas, uh, such as you can see here where the green spray areas are. The white areas are the flight paths where the drones can be flying but not spraying. Uh, next slide, please, Wynne. It's so a here's a little, bit. yeah, it's Go a little ahead. bit blurry, sorry. Uh, so uh, here's a case study we did uh, for some weed control uh, at a property we worked on, um, Gateway Wagyu Farm, east of Gloucester in New South Wales. So this particular um, portion of the property was 300 hectares. Uh, you can see there we've marked out in the green in the picture where the areas where the drones actually sprayed. So that was identified as being either lantana, croft and weed, um, tobacco bushes or any other sort of woody weed that uh, we wanted to remove from the pasture landscape. So the total area treated was 300 hectares. We used uh, 153 hectares of herbicide. So the application cost for us to do the mapping and spraying was $17,000 and we used $38,250 worth of chemical. Uh, as you can see, it was, you know, 50, 49% of the area was actually covered in uh, those said weeds. So a helicopter wouldn't have been able to do anything other than just blanket spray the whole 300 hectares. So the application cost of uh, $37,575 worth of chemical. So we've had a reduction in uh, chemical use by 49%, as well as a total saving of 190 $191 uh, dollars per hectare Australian dollars, so significantly um, better on the uh, farmer's budget, but also on the environment with the reduced uh, application of uh, so much herbicide and the reduced uh, off-target species to natural habitat, such as the remnant trees that uh, exist on the property. Okay, thank you, James, for sharing the uh, challenge the opportunity and also a successful case. From here, I will introduce the whole workflow of using drones for wheat spraying on pasture. Um, the workflow involves three steps, pasture mapping as step one, image processing and mission planning as step two, 
and target is spring as step three. Um, I will then dive into the details and introduce the tools involved, some setup skills, and also the performance. So first of all, pasture mapping. The purpose of doing pasture mapping is one, to get a high resolution imagery of your pasture so that we can identify the weak patches on the pasture for precision spraying. And second purpose is to get a 3D model of the terrain so that we can plan 3D flight paths um, for safe operation. The tool that we recommend for pasture mapping purpose is Mavic 3 Multispectral Drone. This is a very uh, new, small, portable drone, but very powerful. Efficiency-wise, it could map uh, about 57 hectares on hilly terrain um, in a normal 30 minutes operation time. Um, it has a built-in RTK module, which is very critical for centimeter level accuracy, so that we could identify exactly where the weeds are and spray right on top of those weeds and we can also generate terrain follow fly paths. A third feature, which is also very important, is the auto terrain following feature on slope mapping. Um, previously, in order to do slope mapping, um, surveying type of mapping, we would need to import a digital service model data layer into the older generation drones in order for the drone to follow those terrain. Um, but in this drone, we introduce a new feature. It would be able to use the sensors on board to sense the terrain level and then follow it automatically. The purpose is to maintain the same height along the whole surveying process so that we get images with the same resolution and also with the same overlapping ratio. Um, moreover, this drone combines both RGB camera and multi-spectral camera on one platform. Um, multi-spectral camera is what, be, what could we use it for. On pasture, as an example, we could use it to monitor the health of the pasture. For example, um, after seeding, we would like to see how well the seed emerges in a certain time period. Then we could use this drone to do mapping and use NDVI indices to uh, quantitative um, the recovery uh, ratio. Okay, and here I would like to share some setup skills on Mavic 3 multi-spectral drone. First of all, RTK is always required, so make sure you turn it on for the purpose that we mentioned. And second, the flight height, because we would need a ground sampling distance of around and less than 2.5 centimeter to make sure we could identify the weeds on the pasture so you should always set the flight height to about 100 meters or less. Um, and third, make sure you turn on the real-time terrain follow as I showed on the right side. This will make sure that the drone maintains a constant height above the terrain when doing the mapping. And last, uh, if the only purpose is to do pasture mapping for spring purpose, you could select only the RGB option. Um, for other missions uh, of other purpose, such as health monitoring, then you could turn on the multi-spectral cameras as well. Here I have two example images showing how the weeds, the weed bushes actually looks like on the Mavic 3 multi-spectral, uh, on the Mavic 3 imagery. On the left one are blackberry patches, and on the right side is the lantana bushes. Um, so you can see that here, these bushes are where the spring drone should target on. And a image resolution and quality like this one would allow us to draw down the patches for precision spraying purpose. Okay, and step two is image processing and mission planning. Um, for this step, uh, you have the option of two uh, software. One is DJ Terra, Another one is DJI Smartphone Web. Function-wise, they are very similar to each other. Um, the differences would be that DJI Terra is a desktop software, so it will allow you to do offline processing. Um, for example, if, we, if you want to process the data right away at the edge of the pasture, um, you, and you don't have 
internet access on the pasture, which I think is very common <laughs> in many places of the world, then you could use DJI Terra. Um, on the other side, DJI Smartphone is a web-based application. So it do, does the data processing and storage online. So in that case, you don't need to worry about the uh, storage space of your local device or losing the data because you lose the hard drive. Um, so um, that's for data safe, safety purpose. You can also share the data through cloud instead of using SD card. Um, that's another advantage using the web-based application. For either software um, in image processing and mission planning process, there are four steps. Step one would be to upload the imagery from Mavic 3 Mavic Special to either Terra or the smartphone web. And second, the software will automatically stitch the imagery to generate high resolution automosic imagery and also a 3D terrain model. Step three, based on the high resolution imagery, you would need to identify the wheat, the wheat patches such as blackberry or lantana on the pasture context. And step four is to generate a 3D fly paths, which follows the terrain for the airgrass for the spring jewel and also identify turn on and off area during this mission. And um, some setup skills. First of all, it's very important that we use the fruit tree mode um, on the agricultural application um, on Terra or smartphone web. Purpose of using fruit tree mode, one is that it will allow us to generate 3D fly paths because a lot of the pastures are on slopes. There are steep slopes and there are obstacles uh, like trees and power poles as well. So generating a predefined 3D path, 3D uh, pass would uh, ensure safe operation. Purpose two is that this mode would allow you to identify a target for precise spraying. Um, so before start reconstruction, make sure you select fruit tree under the scene um, for reconstruction. Um, and when the reconstruction, when the processing finished, um, the next step would be to um, classify the target into correct classes. So there are three land cover uh, classes we should pay attention to in pasture spring. Um, one, of course, wheat, and second one, power pole, power line, and tall trees, which are the normal, the common obstacles on pasture. And three are the other objects, like lower trees, ponds, and grasslands. So wheat, our purpose is to spray right on top of those bushes. Um, so this wheat objects should be classified as the fruit tree, which is the spraying object in fruit tree mode. What you would need to do is to use the modify result tool in Terra um, as an example to brush the wheat bushes into fruit tree. So the example show here, the purple, the purple areas are the wheat patches that uh, we should modify into and for the spring zone to target on. Second classes marked as red here are obstacles that we want to avoid, uh, which are normally power pole, power line, and trees. So you could classify those into the pole class in the fruit tree mode. And all the other objects like lower trees, ponds, and grasslands, which we can fly over it, but don't want to spray on, you could leave it um, or modify it into others class. So what the drone will do is it will still fly over those areas, but will not turn on the spring nozzle. So this is the uh, field object modification process. And the next one, when we have the object uh, precisely classified, what we need to do is to break the big field into plot, or say into missions for the spring zone to spray. Um, there are several considerations we should pay attention to. One is for each plot, uh, it should be planned close to a takeoff location. So as I show here, um, the blue one is a, a road, a flat road, which is a good takeoff location then you need to make sure all the spring plots are close um, to this takeoff location. And second, 
all the plots should be within light of sight from your takeoff location. And third, we should plan the plot at a reasonable size um, for the purpose of minimizing non-spring flight distance. And here, I would like to invite James to share his real-world um, experience of how we break the missions into reasonable sized plots. James, could you um, please share your experience? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Wing. So the uh, the field there on the right hand side there where it's split into multiple portions. So we were actually flying two drones on that. So uh, to minimize the amount of traveling backwards and forwards um, to and from the start point or the break point. So we find a suitable position where we're going to be able to fly from and we draw a field mission um, to our left and to our right and we would deploy the two drones um, one in each portion and then we would continue to move along the field uh, finding suitable takeoff and landing spots and trying to have the mission so that uh, like wing said they're visible line of sight but also large enough so that uh, you're not moving too often so we try and work on uh, around five hectares per plot and yeah move along uh, with parallel uh, portions like that. If you're using one drone, you could potentially mark the whole area as one uh, one mission and continue to move yourself along as the as the drone progresses through the field. Okay, thank you, James. about the lagging. Okay, so when we finish planning the plot, um, the next one is to select a correct spring type or say proper spring type according to the scenario. There would be two spring types that we recommend depending on your scenario. Uh, one is the continuous spring with equal distance interval and the second one is spot spring with tree crown. Um, if your wheat patches are big and connected, um, examples here, um, the purple ones are the wheat patches, and in this scenario, it's quite the coverage is big and they are connected. In that scenario, you could use the continuous spring mode with equal distance interval. So the, the flight paths generated would be like on the right side. The drone will fly over the field, but will only turn on the nozzle when there's a wheat patch. And a second scenario would be that if your wheat patches are small and they are scattered from each other, um, a way to improve the efficiency is to use the spot spring and cheat crown. As a result, the drone will only fly over the um, centroid of the wheat patches, hover, and then do the spring. So not only the efficiency is improved, the chemical uh, reduction is also more um, significant comparing with the continuous type. But uh, for which time you should use, um, that highly depends on the scenario and picking wisely would help you to improve the efficiency and also reduce the chemical usage. Okay, and that step three would be targeted spring on um, aircraft drone such as T40. And again, I would like to invite James to share his experience about parameter setting on T40 for spring wheat on pasture and also explain the logic behind the parameter, why you set the parameters in this way. James, please go ahead. Sure. So depending on how thick a weed canopy you've, you've got um, and what the chemical requirements are of the chemical label, but Typically, uh, we would use as a starting point 50 litres of water per hectare on a lot of these uh, plant species we've been talking about today. Uh, a flight height needs to be set appropriate to the sort of terrain you're, you're flying in. So if it's not too, uh, too arduous sort of terrain, so you know, moderate to steep slope uh, flight three metres, uh, up to really extreme stuff where you've got large trees and a lot of obstacles and very steep terrain, you may need to increase your height up to potentially around six metres to be able to fly safely. Uh, swath width, we typically set at seven and a half metres. This is, gives us a good overlapping coverage. And as far as flight speed goes, well, flight speed needs to be the maximum that the aircraft will 
will do based on what your water rate is. So at a water rate of 50 litres per hectare, a T40 will fly at approximately 18 kilometres an hour. So um, yeah, adjust your uh, perimeters based on your own scenarios, but uh, there's a few uh, starting points to get started with. Thank you, James. So a uh, couple of drill models uh, for Agras would be compatible in this red flow, uh, including Agras T40, um, T20B, T30, and T10. So you could use each uh, either one for um, wheat spring purpose on pasture. And that was the entire red flow for uh, wheat spring. And last, I would like to invite James to share his exp experience about the full solution setup including the drone and its accessories and also the trailer setup. Thanks, Wing. So to do this uh, spot spraying, just to recap on what we've been through, so you need to have an RTK base station, uh, and DRTK2, to be able to run any of these uh, fruit tree modes through Terra. So you also need the uh, M3M or M3 multispectral to capture your imagery to start with. And then, uh, well, we personally use T40s, but uh, any of the Agris spray drones that are compatible with the DJI Terra and fruit tree mode, uh, one battery charger and three batteries to go with your drone. Uh, there's also a new product out that we've been using and testing uh, called the DJI Relay. This is really good for in mountainous terrains to maintain uh, good communications with your drone in all sort of scenarios. Uh, so the stuff on the left there uh, is the sort of basic kit that you would need uh, to get yourself going. Um, and then uh, you need to, to be able to deploy that stuff somehow uh, in the field. So you need to be able to have a power supply, a generator to power your drones and charge your batteries. You need to have a water supply and you need to have a chemical mixing system as well as uh, storage and transportation ability for uh, your drones and associated equipment. So uh, this picture here is a, a trailer that we've uh, set up and used. And uh, we've got a short video of me doing a bit of a walkthrough uh, that we'll have a look at and um, show you what, what needs to be done to deploy these things in the field. G'day guys, it's James here from agdrone.au and I'm here to show show you around our brand new T40 drone trailer. So this is a fully alloyed built drone trailer. It has a 1500 litre water tank underneath the floor, a 18 kVA diesel generator in behind the two boxes on each side. It's got drone storage for two T40s that are on slides so you can pull them out, an overhead hoist that can lift them onto the ground so you don't have to manhandle the drone. Uh, this section here, the battery charging station where you can have your battery set up, your battery charges. Uh, it's the same on both sides of this trailer, so there's three lots of drawers on each side for spare parts, any other odds and ends you want to take with your spraying. Up the front here, we've got another storage box. Hold your T40 spreaders, your RTK base station. You can also put your M300 if you run an M300 in there, or your M3Ms, any other associated equipment like that. It's fitted with electric brakes and breakout system. So around this side is your office area. So you set up your computers and uh, just your day to day field office basically. Down the back here, this section here is for your chemical mixing drums, uh, any surfactants, small drums that you want to carry around. Uh, we've got a freshwater rinse down hose, got a pressure system on it that's mounted underneath. We've got a 20 meter one inch fill up hose for filling your drone with. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, 18 kVA silent diesel generator. So you don't have to wear earmuffs, you don't have to fill it up every day. 184 litre fuel tank, so you can get two or three days of flying out with two T40s. Uh, there's still a 
the mixing panel is still going to be fitted to this trailer. 400 litre conical mixing tank. And uh, I think this is a perfect combination with the generator being centrally located, the water tank stretching the length of the chassis underneath, uh, and your mixing tanks, rinse down hose, as I mentioned. Uh, I think it's got everything you need to be a efficient drone operator and go contracting with this. Is off the shelf, out the gate, put your drones in it, you're in work. So. Any questions, get in touch with us on our website, agdrone.au, or get in touch with us on our social networks as well. Thank you very much. So there's there's obviously more than one way to set up a drone trailer, but uh, that's the way we've set up this trailer. You can obviously use smaller petrol generators that are much lighter. You could also use a thousand litre shuttle, or you could also uh, deploy existing uh, equipment you might have on your farm, such as a quick spray unit, to use as your uh, water tank uh, to cut around um, the paddock. So uh, depending on what your situation is, um, there's multiple ways to deploy drones, but this trail is just one way that uh, we've come up with that we think ticks all the boxes. Thanks, Wing. Okay, thank you, James, for uh, introducing the trailer setup. And I know you have been using the drones for many other purposes on pasture, in addition to wheat spraying, such as seeding and fertilization. Could you also talk uh, more on those applications, please? So uh, in a lot of the steep terrain that we do our spot spraying and woody weed control on, once we've controlled the woody weeds, we also want to do a pasture improvement program. So this has typically been done with either by helicopter or even uh, back in the day by hand seeding because um, a lot too steep to uh, to drive around on. So we've been spraying out with the drones and then broadcasting seed on. Uh, we get a very good result, as you can see on the right hand side there, that's all been seeded down. Uh, the advantage of the drone is that we can uh, go to small areas. We've got the flexibility of uh, being able to get the even cover, like I said, uh, it's fast and uh, less labour intensive than doing it by hand. Uh, on the right hand side there, you've got a couple of settings. So every farm is a little bit different, I appreciate. So depending on what the actual outcome is uh, and the seed mix that you're putting on. So this rye and oats mix that we've been doing quite a lot of, somewhere between 20 and 60 kilos, depending on the farm operation. Uh, we like to spread seed quite high, uh, keeps the aircraft flying fast and efficiently, as well as out of danger of uh, obstacles. So we fly at eight metres uh, and a swath width of seven and a half, but that will change depending on what seed type you're putting out. And again, uh, fly the aircraft as fast as what it'll allow you to. And in the radar settings, we use uh, the mountain terrain with auto obstacle avoidance on for when we're doing this sort of work. Uh, if you can get to the next slide there, Wing, so there's multiple sort of operations we do as far as using the, the spreader goes. I'm still just waiting for my slide to load. Yep. It's a little bit slow. Okay. Uh, I still can't see it, sorry. Hmm, it's still... Um... I think it's loading. Can you see it now? Ah, uh, yes. So okay. not only not only can you do a complete spray out and uh, sowing, you can also uh, do over sowings with legumes and herbs, such as in this scenario here. So uh, lighter seeding rates than the uh, the Ryan Oates scenarios. So uh, this picture here on the right here with the buggy. So that was an over sowing of a worn out pasture with some. Uh, different clover species as well as plantain and chicory so uh, really useful drones are for doing over sowing such as this so a few scenarios would be um, putting some clover or loosening to some subtropical pastures or just topping up a pasture with more legumes um, whatever you want to do really um, so yeah very useful for doing over sowing jobs as well as uh, complete sowing jobs if you can go to the next slide there, please, Wing. So I think we've got, um, oh, so we're on fertiliser, sorry. Uh, so also um, we do quite a lot of fertiliser application, again, typically in hilly sort of terrain where you can't drive on. 
uh, using products such as urea and dap to top dress pastures uh, that have either been re-sown uh, via ourselves or even dairy pastures post post grazing so you've got the flexibility of being able to put it on whenever you want uh, in steep terrain or if it's um, waterlogged ground that you can't get a, a tractor or spreading truck on uh, there's nothing stopping you any time to be able to uh, fly it on um, with fertilizer spreading you need to make sure that you get your paddock designs right so that you're not trying to taxi the fertilizer too far so you're getting maximum efficiency out of your drone to do this. Uh, a lot of the times we're going sort of 50 to 150 kilos to the hectare. Again, we like to uh, fly fairly high, so eight metres. And uh, depending on the product, typically around uh, 10 metre swaths and maximum speed of 25 kilometres an hour with our fertiliser spreading. Uh, you got the next slide there, Wynn? Yep, it's loading. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so here's a couple of other examples of uh, successful jobs we've done doing uh, some of the previously mentioned uh, methods. So the job on the left there in the upper Maclay Valley, so that was covered in lantana and blackberries and stuff like that. Um, so we've uh, removed the woody weeds uh, and then we've spread a pasture mix on there and pasture improvement. So you can see um, good even coverage and germination uh, and you can see the cattle there grazing it already. So the bottom of that first picture there, you can see the sort of native pastures that were there as well as, um, yeah, woody weed infestations. Uh, the picture on the right there uh, is a spraying and sowing job done at Barrington. Uh, the point of this picture is to show you that uh, drones can fly in all sorts of terrain. So uh, this was sprayed out. Um, the trees were marked as obstacles, so we didn't actually spray the trees. So we haven't got herbicide damage to the trees. And we've been able to sow it down and es effectively establish new pasture there, uh, which is used for um, on a dairy farm, actually. So you can uh, greatly improve the productivity of land by doing some of this uh, pasture improvement work using drones. Uh, next slide there, Wing. Yep. Uh, so this is my company um, website. If you'd like to find out a bit more, uh, feel free to contact me on some of those details there. Okay, thank you. Thank you, James, very much for the very informative sharing and presentation. Um, that's the pre all of the presentation part of this webinar today. Uh, from here, we will open up for questions um, to have an open discussion. Um, I've muted everyone, but what you could do is to type your questions in the chat window. We'll look at it, and then either uh, James or myself will answer those questions. At the same time, um, I do want to invite you again to fill in a webinar survey to let us know what you think about this webinar. Um, the purpose is to make our future ones better to uh, fit your demand. So thank you very much for doing that for us. Okay, I do have some questions. First one, where can we get the training materials? Uh, good question. Uh, so after this webinar, we will post the, rec the recording um, on DJI Agricultural YouTube and also post it on Facebook so you could watch the replay. And another question is, can spot spring mission be produced? with imagery from the P1, or does it need to be the Mavic Green Multispectral? I think, James, you could answer this question perfectly. Uh, yes, so we predominantly do use an M300 and a P1 camera. Uh, and to do this Blackberry work, what we do in Lantana work, um, a lot of the stuff that you've seen here today, um, 
has been P1 imagery as well as M3M, but you can use uh, a P1 definitely. Um, and we typically try and uh, do a, a ground sensing distance or resolution of one centimeter GSD, uh, but you can get away with much larger GSDs than that, uh, depending on the terrain and also the size of the weeds that you're hoping to be able to identify in your imagery. So as long as you can see them, um, there's no problem with, um, yeah, increasing your uh, GSD and imagery. Okay, thank you, James. Another question uh, from Patrick. What was the height of the trailer? People are curious about the trailer. Uh, the weight, yeah. Hey, Patrick. The, uh, the weight, yeah. <laughs> the weight. Sorry. That's okay. Uh, yeah, the trailer hasn't actually been, because uh, it's not quite finished, there's a few touching things. It's still got to go to the weigh bridge. Uh, so I can let you know how much that is, but it is uh, fully alloy. Uh, and I have towed it around um, the, a few places to get some stuff added onto it. So uh, it tows beautifully and uh, it's quite light, um, but I'll have to let you know about the weight. Okay, thank you, James. Um, another question from Danny. Can you do a webinar on mapping with the T40 with its own controller and RTK? So not using the Mark 3, Mark Spectral, or Terra and Smartphone. Uh, I can answer this. Um, good suggestion, good advices. We will consider in the future webinars. But I think using T40 itself for mapping or using a Mavic 3, Mark Spectral, this should be Chose this should be uh, chosen based on the mapping area. Like for pasture, for example, a lot of those are big fields, especially if you are doing service, if you are mapping it as a service and spring as a service for your customers, then uh, myself would recommend using a mapping drone specifically for efficiency and also cost purpose. But if you are doing smaller area most of the time or only use it on your own farm, then T40's mapping module is also a very good option for you as well. Um, James, if you have anything to comment at, at on, please do. Uh, yeah, Wing, I agree that um, for a lot of the pasture work that we do, um, the, the T40 doesn't have the capabilities as far as being able to map in quite steep terrain and large fields. Uh, so you are best to um, use an M3M or uh, another like high output sort of, uh, like was mentioned earlier, like a P1 camera on an M3M if you want to do really large areas. But in a lot of cases, an M3M is the best uh, job for the machine for the job. Thank you, James. Another question from Juan. What is the best height when we are mapping with the uh, M3M? So I guess you are, so this highly depends on the scenario and your purpose of the mapping, but I guess you are asking more for the pasture wheat mapping purpose, right? Um, if that's the case, well, I, I will let James answer. What is the best height if we use Mavic 3 Mata Special to do the mapping? Uh, yes, so that is without knowing what sort of terrain you're wanting to be able to fly in. Um, it's difficult to actually say, but between 80 and 100 metres should be should be sufficient. If you're trying to identify smaller weeds, uh, obviously you need to reduce your height. Um, but you need to be also aware of, uh, depending on whereabouts in the world you're from, um, the height of the trees can be really quite high. So it's probably not safe to fly uh, much lower than about 60 metres, but uh, I would be flying it typically around 80 metres to get good quality imagery for uh, doing what we're wanting to do. Thank you, James. And also based on my quite limited experience, but I've looked at some data set from Mavic 3 Manta Special on pasture. Um, most of the time in order to identify big bushes of blackberries and lantana, um, a GST, GSD of about two centimeters is quite enough. But of course, if your wheat patches are smaller, then lower the height to make sure you get a good uh, quality. Um, and okay, the next question also from Juan, how much memory we have in the cloud of smartphone web? 
um, there's no limit on the memory that you could leverage on smart farm web. Um, yeah. So um, another question is, uh, it's a T40 question. Is there any scope to further increase droplet size on the T40? Extra course 500 is still too fine for some herbicide application. Okay, I, I guess that's a question for me. It's more of a product improvement uh, issue. So um, not at the moment, uh, to be honest, it's not supported by the software, um, but that's something we could consider. Um, easy, I feel, I, I've also leave my email here, uh, wing.zhong.appdj.com. Do you mind sending me an email to give me a little bit more background information so that we could evaluate um, how necessary this would be and whether we should incorporate into the future product roadmap. Thank you. Okay. Um, yep, so uh, again, as I mentioned, both James and myself's email are here. If you have any further questions about using drones for pasture, don't hesitate to contact us, uh, especially James, he's super experienced in this scenario and have a lot of real world uh, experience, uh, either for spring and also providing service to pasture clients. And um, again, uh, if you have any suggestions for us, uh, product wise or webinar wise or content wise, um, you could scan this QR code and build in the short survey and leave your advices. Much appreciated. Oh, I see a new question here. Is it possible to input third party shape file for spot application purpose in T40? Um, I could answer this one. Uh, so, yes, answer is yes. And there are two options for importing third party map. One is to import a shape file, and second one is to import a GeoTIFF. Different, there are two different uh, formats. Um, Shapefile is best if you have only a couple patches and they are uh, further away from each other, they are scattered. Um, in that case, you could generate those patches as Shapefile polygons and then import it into the remote controller. What the remote controller will do is it will treat those polygons or say patches as single uh, separated missions just like a field, and then do the spraying uh, one after another. The second option, importing a GeoTIFF, or what we usually call it a RX file, a prescription file, um, that is best for the scenario that you have a lot of patches um, connected or scattered on the field, or if you want to do variable rate, not just spot spraying. In that case, you could leverage the prescription GeoTIFF format. Uh, we provide a standard format for you. And by generating your file in that standard format, you could also import to the remote controller. Um, please also send me an email. I could forward you with more training materials on those two topics. Okay, and a question from Oscar. Um, I guess it's also a question for me. <laughs> uh, I have tried to use Smart Farm for this kind of workflow, but find that the mapping upload takes a long time. Is there any, any information about the Smart Farm workflow for spot spraying sin, uh, situation? So um, I guess there are two questions here. The first one, uh, the uploading takes a long time. That is true, and it highly depends on your uh, internet bandwidth. If you have quite limited upload bandwidth, um, you should consider using the local, the desktop version, Terra. Um, however, what we have found so far, a, a um, best practices would be that you could leave it uploading, you could leave the uploading on at night and turn on the auto reconstruction option on Smart Farm. What it will do is while you're sleeping, it will do the uploading. And when it finish uploading, it will do the processing automatically. So you don't really need to wait 
uh, when you wake up the next day, you have the result ready. So um, that would fit a workflow uh, of doing the job, meaning uh, mapping in the day and then uploading and processing at night. If it's a very time sensitive task and you have to have the result uh, at the edge of the field, then definitely go for the uh, JTERRA option. And second question, is there any information about the smart farm workflow for spot spring situation? Uh, honestly, we don't have any tutorial video ready for that yet. The whole logic is the same as Terra. The major steps are the same, but the interactions, the buttons, the layout of the buttons are a little bit different. Um, but we will consider um, making some contents uh, on smart farm workflow as well. Thank you for the advices. And James also comment uh, under the shape file for spot spring. Um, do you have content for that or anything you want to share? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we've got some software that can uh, help smooth out some of that um, stuff. So if anyone's wanting to uh, automate some of that workflow a little bit more, um, feel free to uh, flick me an email there and I'll um, help share some of my, um, some of the stuff we do behind the scenes with you. Mm -hmm. um, just another heads up, we'll be making webinars like this one in the coming days. So do pay attention to DJI's channel um, to follow our following webinars. Okay, I don't see any new questions coming in. I guess that's it for today. Again, I want to thank James very much for your time and sharing the experience doing the webinar with us today. And also thank you all the audience for joining the webinar. Much appreciated and we are very glad to have you. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone.